Hello, welcome to Progressive Oregon, a weekly engagement broadcast on progressive issues in Oregon. My name is Larry Taylor, and I'm here today with my co-host, Betsy Cunningham. If you would like to ask questions during the show, go to the Uphill Media channel in YouTube and type in your questions. Betsy will relay them to us, and we will do our best to get them answered. Uh, today on our agenda, we have two guests joining us. We have Leah LaFleur, who's running for uh, Portland Metro District 6, and then she'll be followed by Andrew Scott Becker, who's going to give us an update on what's going on in California. Um, so starting off with Leah, welcome, Leah. Hi, Larry. It's great to see you this morning. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, Oz, did we get the uh, the video of the, the the campaign video ready to roll? Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's ready to come up here, Larry. Let me uh, see if I can get it uh, kicked on here. Okay, we're going to start with a, her campaign video, and then we'll have a conversation with Leah Lafleur. Hi, I'm Leah Lafleur, and I'm running for Metro Council in District Six. Metro is a tri-county government that mostly manages trash, transit, and parks. You might be asking yourself, who is this Leah LaFleur anyway? Well, we all wear a lot of hats. Among the many hats I wear, I am an engineer, a single mom, a grassroots organizer, a PCC graduate, a Wiccan priestess, a radical knitter, a survivor, a citizen of Metro. So why am I running for Metro? In a word, trash. We are only making more people and they are only making more garbage. Some people find it distasteful to talk trash, but I'm all about it. Our garbage is a problem that isn't going to go away if we ignore it. We need a 21st century solution and I would love the chance to use all my hats to turn our current garbage crisis into opportunities. Please vote for Leah LaFleur for Metro by May 19th, 2020. Let's talk trash. So very interesting. Uh... Uh, so Leah, we've known each other for a couple of years now. Uh, you've always been an amazing source of strength, uh, but then we find out that you're running for Portland Metro. So what moved you to do this? Um, well, I would say that the um, thing that, the journey that led me here was a long one. Um, it started uh, back in eighth grade uh, in a science class where um, I learned that the earth is a closed system. And it made me realize that we don't ever really throw anything away because there is no away in a closed system. It all stays inside. Um, after that, um, I um, the next piece of my puzzle came in a, a, a social work class um, in college. That was my first um, career. Um, and an instructor said uh, to the class, hey, has anybody in this room ever thought of running for office? And no hands went up. And he said, you know, that's the problem. Uh, business people run for office, attorneys run for office. They write laws that um, shape their industries or are informed by their industry opinion. You know, who who's making the laws that represent the people? And at that point I was like, okay, you know, I, I could do this. I could run for office one day. Um, then in 2001, I moved to Portland, Oregon uh, from Michigan and um, uh, met a woman who uh, told me about her mayor, um, a guy from Burlington, Vermont, uh, named Bernie Sanders, and how he had just got elected to the House of Representatives. Um, I started following his career. He was the only person to vote against the Iraq War. Um, I would see him railing uh, against income inequality, you know, at C-SPAN at 3 a.m., you know, just he has been a, a man of integrity um, and consistency. Um, and has always said the right things as far as I was concerned. And I said, okay, well, if he ever runs for president, I'm going to do whatever I can do to help him. Um, the next piece of the puzzle came um, in uh, my second career shift. Um, I um, got into uh, work doing patents and uh, wanted to move up in my career. So I uh, went back to school and studied electronics engineering technology at Portland Community College, um, specializing in renewable energy. And I learned so many things um, that would improve our world. Um, renewable energy technologies and clean energy technologies that we're just not using. Um, and the thing that really got me the most excited about all of this was a technology called pyrolysis, um, which um, converts any carbon-based waste into a liquid biofuel and a charcoal product. Um, and since I learned early to have an appreciation about trash and where it goes. 
um, that just seemed like the perfect thing to do to, to start to employ a system like that. Um, when Bernie eventually ran for president, um, I was all in for Bernie. I volunteered for his campaign. I did all sorts of stuff. I was a volunteer at the Moda Center rallies where the little bird landed on his podium. That was a, a memorable experience. Um, I was a delegate to Philadelphia um, and when um, for Bernie and when he didn't um, get the party's nomination, um, he said to us, you know, well, what would we do tomorrow? It, we would do the same thing if I did get the party's nomination, you know, we'll join the party, we'll run for office, we'll do all the things that we were gonna do. And I was like, okay, now's the time. Um, and I learned that um, or Oregon has a very unusual, unusual uh, system of regional government that actually we had to get the constitution changed to allow. Um, it's a tri-county government um, that has a very limited set of things that it does. Um, and one of the things that it does is regional solid waste shipping. And I thought, here it is. I will take my excitement about garbage. I will take my um, technology um, information and I will move it into a place where we can actually make, hopefully, um, enormous positive changes uh, in in Portland and in, in the greater world. I would love to see um, a system that we develop and create here to turn our waste into energy um, that is so exceptionally well done that it is a model for other places. And it's it, it happens in San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York and in Paris and you know all around the world. So I, I'm, I'm hoping for the garbage revolution. <laughs> Oz, can we show the slide of the map of her district? Um, it's as uh, for anyone who's watched Portlandia, she is in the heart of Portlandia. Uh, so the colored <laughs> parts of this map are the the uh, the region governed by Metro, and then uh, there's uh, six districts. Yes. And uh, and so Leah is running for District Six, which is right in the heart of Portland. So it's got the Belmont uh, neighborhood, um, uh, a little bit of the East Side. Um, what's What's most interesting is that her opponent ran unopposed four years ago, so he didn't even have to run a campaign. So uh, Leah's doing the right thing in, in uh, giving the voters a choice. So thank you, Leah. <laughs> thank you, Larry. I'm, I'm excited to be called. Uh, so uh, what are the other things that Metro does besides uh, garbage? Um, so the other things that Metro does besides garbage is they manage the um, urban growth boundary. Um, they do regional transportation planning. Um, they own um, the zoo and the convention center and some parks. Um, and uh, yes, that's that's mostly that's mostly it. There there's not a, a lot on that they that they do. It is mostly um, about coordination among the three counties. And by convention center, does that also include the Coliseum? Um, that I don't know. That's such a great old building, and I, I think it does. And if it does, it would be great if you could move along the the preservation and restoration of that building. Uh, it's just a, it's one of the best designs that Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill did in Portland, and it'd be just a tragedy to lose it. So. I will look into that. If you end up governing that uh, in some way, it would be great if you uh, got involved. Uh, okay. Did you have other plans for other parts of uh, other things that Metro did? Like, do you see any changes needed for the zoo, like perhaps preservation of the train? <laughs> uh, you know, I would love to see the train preserved. Um, I think it's a real um, asset to the, the community. And I think that, you know, it's just such a, a neat thing for, for the park, for the zoo to have. So I'd like to see the train. Yeah. I remember being on the train when I was a kid. Uh, that's um, how long it's been there. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm totally with you. It'd be a tragedy to lose those things, those aspects of our community that make it unique, uh, because you you don't find that uh, anywhere or everywhere. Yes. yes, and and there is so much about Portland that is changing. I've I've been here for almost 20 years, and there are places I can go now where I'm just like I don't even know where I am. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've experienced that as well. Uh, so one of the, the the great things about you is that you have an inner strength that is just uh, awesome. And so do you know where that comes from? 
I mean, you have a, a will of iron. <laughs> well, um, I would say that um, I've had kind of a complicated time, um, but that even though things, certain things have been difficult for me, that I have seen the opportunities in them and always tried to um, make the best of things. Um, I think that I don't, I don't necessarily know that anything happens for a reason, but I think that we can derive meaning from the things that happen. And I, I think that I, that's an asset um, that I have. And I think that I, I, it's really worked to make uh, me into the person I am today. Well, for those of you who don't know, Leah is the chair of the third congressional district in the Democratic Party of Oregon. And earlier this year, we had a, an election of the standing members of the committees of the Democratic Party of Oregon. Uh, she had three parliamentarians observing everything that went on. Uh, she had her own personal <laughs> parliamentarian. She had the parliamentarian of the Democratic Party of Oregon. And then I was there as well, just to make sure that uh, uh, I, you know things were, were going well from my perspective. And uh, we went through the day, and it was a kind of a long afternoon. But added up the votes, everything was done with extreme amount of integrity and uh, accuracy, and uh, you adjourned the meeting. And uh, and then two year, two days later, uh, one of the elected uh, started contesting, contesting the results. So we quickly <laughs> grabbed our Robert Schulz of Order to see what it said about uh, contesting results. And uh, it was very clear that you know, you really need to bring up issues during the election. Otherwise, uh, it gets really iffy about changing anything. But the people who own the election are the, the electorate that participated in it. And so if they decide that there was something egregious, it was, you know, that was their decision to make it happen. And so Leah conducted a number of meetings and, and had everyone, uh, gave everyone the opportunity to talk through their issues and, and bring them out. And uh, and ultimately, they decided not to redo the election and let the results stand. But you were getting enormous pressure from the DPO leadership to, uh, to you know, you were ordered to redo the election, which they didn't have the authority to order you to do. And instead of, you know, just capitulating, why, like I think some people would do, you, you held strong. So uh, I found that just to be so impressive. Thank you. Yes, it was, it was a complicated time. Um, and really the thing that um, directed me throughout that experience was that it's not me that makes the decisions. It's not the DPO that makes the decisions. This is a decision that needed to be made by the body. And whatever, I just, I just was there to hold space and facilitate for the will of the body. And as the election was not improper. Um, it was important to me also to hold space for people to air grievances and um, repair community if we could do that. So um, I was glad that um, that the meeting was called, um, that um, people attend, pretty much everybody who attended the election also attended the meeting. Um, and we we had a very productive um, event, even though I would say the outcome was not uh, what was desired by the person with the grievance. However, all of that has been resolved since then. So. Yeah, it's just one big happy family again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so two things. One thing is that you know I, I really appreciate your respect for democracy, and uh, and you know with other people in the party, you know they would think that they're the empress or the emperor, and that they get to make the decision, and they they're going to impose them will, which is not dem democracy. Uh, and then the second thing you did was you gave time in between the events for people to. Uh, to let the emotions dissipate and get back to rational thinking, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. Because my, you know, my inclination is to get in there and get this resolved and move on. But you took the opposite approach. You let people think about it and then allow them to come to the right conclusion, which I wish we would do more frequently because I see so many decisions now made based on emotion instead of uh, facts. Uh, and it's very disappointing to see that. Yes, I would agree. Um, and thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, uh, and I know personally for me, um, when I, my reacting self is never my best self. 
Um, so <laughs> to step back, to take some time to think about things and to process them, um, coming at things with a more, um, yes, like you said, a rational mind um, makes processes flow better. <laughs> I try to never do anything before 10 a.m. in the morning, which is why this show starts at 10. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good policy. <laughs> so do you have plans for uh, connecting with your constituency once you get elected? Um, yeah, well, so right now um, I'm kind of in a, a phase where I'm doing a lot of stuff to get ready for my um, campaign um, activities, like meeting um, at coffee houses or um, at neighborhood association uh, meetings. Uh, those are things that I'm going to do now and continue on um, after I get elected. I think that um, really, in order to make decisions most effectively, uh, you need stakeholder participation. You need people um, who are in the communities that are affected by the things that you um, are um, legislating or, or um, um, implementing uh, to be able to um, to participate in the conversation and feel like they have ownership of it as well. And this is particularly important in um, frontline communities and communities of color um, that we are able to um, really hear um, all of the perspectives and and make um, wise decisions based on on as many communities as we can get input from um, instead of what has been done in the past, which is a pretty paternalistic system of top-down um, business decision decisions being made um, with elected leaders and businesses um, not really involving the communities in which um, these things are occurring. Is there anything else you'd like to say about your candidacy? Um, that this is incredibly exciting. Um, I'm, I feel like I've been working up to this moment most of my life. Um, I feel very excited about the opportunities ahead of us. Um, and I really hope that this is my opportunity to, to do what I can do to change the world in a positive way. So you're gonna need volunteers. If I wanted to, if I was a resident of Portlandia and I wanted to help your campaign, how do I, how do I reach you? Um, uh, you can reach me through my website. It is Lafleur the number four, Oregon.com. Uh, and if I wanted to shovel money to you, how would I do that? Uh, you can do that on my website as well. And do you have limits on how much you would take? Like if I wanted to write you a check and just buy you for a million dollars, would you take it? <laughs> um, no. Uh, <laughs> it's a very strange question. Um, I'm, and as far as my campaign financing goes, um, I'm only taking it donations from individuals, um, and I'm not taking any money from corporate PACs. Do you, uh, do you expect more than two candidates, or do you think it'll end up just being you and your opponent? Um, it's difficult to say. I mean, I don't think the filing deadline is till like March 10th, so um, yeah. there could be an 11th hour spoiler candidate. Um, the way that um, the Metro election works is it's a nonpartisan race. So um, the election happens in May in the primary. Uh, so um, if one person gets 50% plus one of the vote, uh, that person is elected to Metro. If neither person does, then um, there's a runoff of the top two vote getters uh, in the general in November. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I wish you the best of luck. and. Uh, uh, as we get closer to the election, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to come to Portland and help you out. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Larry. It was great talking with you this morning. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Leah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, next up, we have uh, Andrew Scott Becker, who uh, is a former Oregonian now living in California. He has been on our show before where we talked about the delegate selection plans and the differences between California and Oregon. Uh, time has now passed. Uh, Oregon has now settled on its delegate selection plan. And uh, it sounds like uh, uh, California being the 400 pound gorilla of the, the country is, gets much more leeway in the approval of their plan, but they're, they're pretty much uh, have it finalized as well. Uh, welcome, Andrew. Hello. So what's new in California? I heard you had a quarterly meeting last weekend. Uh, that's right. Yeah, we had a convention uh, for our state central committee. And, uh, it wasn't uh, terribly decisive in anything, but um, uh, we 
do have a delegate selection plan finally that um, people aren't quite sure if we voted on it or not. We definitely didn't put <laughs> on at the convention and uh, the uh, California Democratic Party's uh, record keeping isn't quite uh, very good. So uh, it hasn't been agendized anywhere at any of the past meetings and people are like, yeah, I think we adopted that, um, but I don't remember when. You're, you're taking my breath away. <laughs> do you not have a secretary? Uh, we, we do have a secretary, um, but there aren't any uh, uh, meeting minutes for the uh, either the executive state executive board meetings that uh, uh, might have adopted them or uh, for for other things like that. So it's a little loosey goosey. How does that not set your hair on fire? <laughs> As a parliamentarian, I mean, they they have very strict standards for uh, county central committees and how they provide notice to their members and making sure that there's options for everybody to receive all levels of notice, making sure that we send out our agendas and everything is properly agendized if it's going to come up for a vote, but they don't quite seem to hold themselves to the same standard. How many people attend? Um, so our, our state central committee is about 3,300 people. And then we have an executive board, um, which is a bit more limited. It's more like 300 people. <laughs> so the executive, state executive board um, basically has taken on most of the powers that the state central committee also has. And it meets um, about two times per year um, in between the yearly convention uh, for our state central committee. Um, so it, it, it's kind of a really weird structure where as the state central committee has gotten larger and larger over the years, um, they've empowered the executive board to uh, meet more frequently and be able to adopt all sorts of things that the state central committee might otherwise adopt, such as resolutions or things of that nature. The only thing they can't do is um, officer elections. But I bet they would if they could. Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, what a mess to unwind. Um, so California has moved up its primary. Um, how, is, how has that changed things? Um, people here are, are, are really kind of uh, scrambling to figure out what that's going to mean. Um, we haven't done this early ever before. And associated with it, we did lose some delegates because the, the DNC has a plan um, to try to keep states from going too early and to incentivize states to keep the uh, sort of regular primary structure. Um, so the, the DNC will give additional delegates to states that go late, um, take away some delegates from states that advance their primary um, very early, and then some other extra bonuses for if they if the state includes del, uh, their, their primary on a, like a Super Tuesday when a bunch of other states are voting. So uh, we did land on kind of a Super Tuesday uh, so we will keep some delegates from from that. We, we were previously on another kind of a Super Tuesday. But uh, California is going to be losing uh, about 15% of its delegates because of uh, advancing our primary. And we had to advance our convention, our state central committee meeting also uh, on account of that because um, this last one that we uh, just concluded uh, was doing some endorsements for statewide candidates. So it's kind of thrown a little bit of a monkey wrench. We won't have any state central committee meeting next year, um, just several e-board meetings um, uh, because they moved this one to right at the close of the year. Wow. Um, so one of the things I thought was interesting about Washington's delegate selection plan uh, was that even though they also moved their primary up, um, their selection of delegates doesn't occur until May and June. Um, uh, is that the same or do, does, do your delegate selection processes happen earlier? So it used to happen earlier. We uh, traditionally going very late. Um, most candidates had usually dropped out of the process uh, when California voted until we held our delegates uh, selection um, caucuses for the congressional districts before the actual primary. But um, with the large number of candidates and us advancing our primary to March, um, the congressional district level caucuses will not happen in April after. So that'll be uh, easier for some of the regional uh, directors for the state party who have to 
coordinate and conduct, uh, help conduct some of these uh, uh, delegate selection caucuses because we won't have to do 26 of them or however many candidates there are. Uh, interesting. So uh, how, how many delegates do you elect at the state convention at the, at the very end? So I know we, we, we do uh, uh, a large portion of them through the congressional district caucuses and then the state central committee uh, or the executive board will elect uh, a few additional ones, um, especially to meet some of our uh, diversity quotas and things like that. I don't know exactly the number, but it's about a, a quarter of them uh, at the that are selected later afterwards um, by the state central committee or the executive board. So the oh, that's interesting. So you don't have a delegate election process where the delegates elect the state at large delegates. You have the uh, uh, executive board select them. Yeah, it, it it actually is the delegates. They just uh, they do it during um, uh, some other. Uh, California Democratic Party meeting. So usually an executive board or, or a convention, but it is it is the delegate, the other delegates that select the uh, remainder, technically. Okay. Uh, it took me three presidential cycles before I understood the whole process. And I, I probably could have learned it better earlier if I'd really put my mind to it, but it is just enormously complex uh, and difficult to explain and unwind. Uh, yeah. And, it, and that's in Oregon, which is simpler than, than what you and Washington has. So I, it must be really daunting to someone entering the system uh, now and trying to participate and figure out how to do it. Yeah, when, I, when I'm getting people involved in our, in our county party here, uh, you know, the first two years is uh, just explaining all the rules and bylaws to them so that they can kind of get a feel for what's actually going on in meetings or at the state level. So what else is going on in the California party? Anything of interest? Yeah, well, recently um, our county central committee um, uh, did some controversial bylaws changes where uh, one of the one of the strange uh, artifacts of our bylaws, and it's actually replicated in almost all of the uh, county central committee bylaws down here, is that if you are in the state legislature or if you are a congressperson and your district's uh, even just partially goes into the county, maybe only collecting like 100 voters or say, uh, then you get an ex officio seat on that county party central committee. Um, and so for you know some legislative districts that are wholly contained within the county, um, uh, that, that makes a little bit more sense. But some of these uh, ex officio members on county central committees, uh, like I said, their district might only capture you know 100 or 50 or 500 voters within within a county just taking a little edge off the side or something um so our county party uh recently passed a bylaws amendment um clarifying that anybody including ex officio members uh would have to be actually registered to vote in our county if they want any kind of a seat on our county central committee they can't just say well you know my district kind of goes in there a little bit um, and it's actually in state law that uh, county parties have to do this, but the courts struck that down in 2009. So we said to hell with this and uh, we kicked them out of our uh, county party. And a lot of them were uh, rural districts that had much more moderate uh, Democrats elected to them. So we ended up uh, somewhat changing the voting composition of our, of our central committee and making it more progressive. Uh, which of course caused a big stir and much much consternation. So we got challenged, and uh, there was a challenge brought to the California Democratic Rules uh, Committee against us, uh, trying to get us to uh, reseat uh, the nine members that we had uh, uh, taken off of our central committee roster, and also to undo some endorsements that we had done after that, and uh, repeat. <laughs> and repeal a, a resolution that we had passed condemning our school board for um, bad faith negotiate breaking negotiation contracts with the uh, with the teachers union and all sorts of other things that they're doing that are uh, shady and kind of corrupt uh, but uh, fortunately the rules committee uh, ruled in our favor pretty overwhelmingly there were two complaints against us one we won 25 to 0 and the other one we won 19 to uh, 5 and they said yeah technically I mean the courts say that this law doesn't exist anymore, 
And there's nothing in the state party bylaws saying that, you know, county central committees have to organize themselves in a certain way like this. So they have the right, they followed their own processes to adopt these bylaws amendments. Uh, they had proper notice and the meeting was regular. So there's nothing that, that can be done about these. Wow, we're green with envy. <laughs> <laughs> the stories we could tell about what goes on here. Um, uh, that's very interesting because in Oregon, state law says that the counties are the supreme accord, uh, authority in each county. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's it's a hands off for the state party. They, they do not have the ability to come in and rule on what happens at the county level. It sounds like in or in California, the state party does have some authority over what happens in the counties. Uh, well, some people think that they do uh, more than they actually do. Uh, the, the rules committee ended up deciding um, with the interpretation that we're largely independent bodies and that they can't step in. Um, they, they do, under the, their own bylaws, reserve for themselves certain rights to say if, if there was uh, egregious process violations or something, um, maybe interpretation of the rules, uh, of the county party rules that just couldn't be uh, sustained by any reasonable interpretation, then they might step in and do something about it. But other than that, um, they're supposed to take the, the interpretation that we're largely independent bodies and they can't really change what we what we do or how we act or how we compose ourselves. Even. Cool. So how's the uh, how's the election shaping up uh, uh, presidential wise? Is there is there a, uh, do you know who's filed uh, officially in California? Uh, in, in California, it's it's really easy to get on the ballot, um, even for presidential and the, the list is always extremely long. Uh, so we get not just the candidates that are, that are known, but a list of about 30 or 40 people that are uh, uh, lesser known candidates that also get on. Uh, it was really interesting at the convention, we had a presidential forum um, that was hosted by Univision. And uh, most of the uh, top tier candidates came uh, with the notable absence of Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren. But wow. Bernie Sanders was there, and he uh, uh, they saved the best for last, and uh, he definitely got some of the biggest, loudest response of the evening, which was uh, very encouraging to hear. And then he just made the rounds all night long going to different caucuses. He, he made a stop at the Progressive Caucus meeting afterwards and uh, several others, so it was very good. The uh, California Young Democrats also held their... Um, held a meeting afterwards in which they did a uh, endorsement vote and uh, Bernie Sanders won that on the first round of ranked choice voting with uh, over 66% of the vote. Good for him. Uh, when the DNC met uh, before the convention, uh, it was interesting watching how the, the two candidates approached the delegates. So uh, Hillary would have private parties for anyone who had, of the superdelegates who had pledged for her Right. And so you had to pledge to her to go to her little parties. But Bernie uh, would just walk into a room full of delegates and just start grabbing hands and greeting everyone. Uh, yeah. Very, very different approach to running for office. <laughs> that was good. I mean, the, the whole time I was at the convention, I'd see him popping up everywhere. You know, he'd be at the Progressive Caucus and he'd come to the Young Democrats meeting. And it was, it was really nice to see his, you know, very kind of retail politics down to earth kind of style. Very cool. Anything else you'd like to share about what's going on in California? Yeah, well, the the, the bylaws amendment uh, that we passed that was sustained recently um, has kind of opened up the door. Uh, I know several other county parties that are going to attempt to use this to do the same thing in their county, uh, which will have, uh, I think, a pretty good effect. Uh, our ex officio members in any county are usually much more moderate than the grassroots members who are actually elected to the central committees or involved in other ways. So uh, it had the effect in our county of removing a lot of moderate votes. And um, I think it'll have the same effect in other county parties. And the interesting thing is, you know, it, it goes back to one person, one vote. If, if you're a state legislator, then you shouldn't get to vote on, you know, five different county central committees you should get to vote where you live, just like anybody else. And so I think it's gonna be really interesting to see if we can get more county parties to uh, adopt this interpretation 
and uh, help help them become more progressive and make it kind of harder for legislators and their capital staffers to push a more moderate agenda at the grassroots level. Wow, the party actually run by the people. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. <laughs> yeah, de democracy is a journey. Um, anything else you'd like to share today? Well, that's pretty much it. We're uh, uh, always, you know, causing some good trouble down here. So. <laughs> well, as a, uh, I used to work for Intel, and as Andy Grove used to say, if you aren't pissing anyone off, you aren't doing anything. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us this morning. It was a very interesting update, uh, and we hope to see you again. So, yep. uh, thank you, everyone. Oh, Betsy, I forgot to ask. Did we have any questions on the line? Uh, no. Okay. Um, so, thank you, Andrew, for joining us, and we will see you soon. Oz, we are done.